Um, nice, interesting transitions for slides. Hi, guys. Um, it's a pleasure um, to speak here today. Uh, this particular presentation is about one of our projects with um, NCATS at NIH. It, it is not about Transmart, but it sort of fits really nicely into the um, open data session. So we decided that we bring this um, presentation here basically for a reason to make you aware that this is being done and this is for everybody um, to, to look at and uh, consume once everything is being done and said. So um, for starters, just let me mention that um, we're clearly seeing, as Julie mentioned and so many other people mentioned today, we're seeing um, a true avalanche of data coming in, especially with sequencing data becoming more and more available. And um, there have been quite a few initiatives to share data, and we're seeing more and more of that, and that's a good sign. Some of the examples that are probably worth mentioning um, are, are these. Um, so TCGA, you know that this uh, particular data set is, uh, if not completed, then is near completion. Um, and uh, th there has been um, um, a, a genomic commons implemented to make uh, the data more available and more easily searchable. Um, there, there is a huge amount of data that is being generated, for example, by CHDI, Huntington's Disease Foundation, and they've been releasing, we're we, we aware of that, huge amount of this uh, sequence data into GEO, which is again for everyone to, to get and use. Um, Parkinson disease data set is available, and many others, it's just a few examples. So uh, there is a really uh, clear effort in the community that we're observing to create these um, comments and um, a desire to adopt um, standards. Um, common data models are being developed and um, how would I say, um, they, they make them more consumable really because these data standards obviously were, were here before if quite a few years ago. But now they, it's, it's becoming easier to consume that and so the examples that come to mind are OMOP and CDISC. Um, the, the question though then becomes, so how do you find really good data? So if you're working with a specific project looking at a set of controls and um, trying to maybe uh, find uh, data sets that are complementary to your own research. I'm guessing that's what mo most public data is good for. Where do you go? So in the United States, traditionally, NIH and NCBI resources um, uh, were, are the resources that people often look to for high quality, and I call them arbitrated data, um, because basically um, these venues, they spend time and money to make sure that the data they publish is pretty good. So um, NIH specifically uh, has launched really um, a massive effort a few years ago to expand this collection of gold standard data. So um, there are several projects going on. I'm sure most of you are aware of these. Um, one of the projects is called Genus. It's uh, actually um, meant for mostly regulatory people. Um, it um, basically uh, allows you to identify correctly all the ingredients in any um, consumable product, all the way down to dyes and uh, you know anti-caking agents, agents or what have you and be able to find any um, toxicity data related to these agents. And I, I believe that that particular requirement will become mandatory in Europe and just, um, well, if not now, then in a few months. Another project uh, is in Insight, which is spelled with an X very creatively. Um, so this one um, th is the one I'm going to talk about. So the vision for the Insight project is really grand. It's basically the idea is that it will be a massive repository for all the compounds that ever had any biological activity. And that can span from compounds you know, used in humans all the way to some obscure uh, member of some HTS library that was screened against some assay and, and had some activity. 
And in this repository for all of these compounds, there will be data available that covers really several uh, categories. So it starts with simple stuff such as IDs and structure, and uh, then goes into physical and anatomy properties, and then moves on to targets, and by um, extension, affected pathways. Um, if pharmacogenomics data is available, it will be available as well. So um, by linking with clinical trial repository information, you would know which compounds um, were tested, what the results were, and things like that. And even um, descriptions uh, are planned for um, broadly three categories of um, consumers, researchers, clinicians, and actual your average people who don't really speak the lingo, but they don't want to know about this compound if they're searching for data. Um, so the difficult part of, so, so, you know, massive amounts of information. And at the onset, we knew that they are aiming to cover about close to 50,000 compounds. That turns out to be the amount um, of compounds we collectively have synthesized and tested over the period of few years. Um, and the difficult part of this project is this. So NIH doesn't want a simple aggregation of data from already available repositories such as PubCam and PubSubstance. They want a stamp of manual curation on every single item that is in this database. And um, the reason, because they want to be a gold standard for the content for everyone to use, just like all other resources at NIH are striving to be. So this is a little bit difficult, right? So you, we can aggregate data, we can integrate data. Putting a stamp of manual curation on every single item is a massive amount of effort. So we've been uh, working with this team for um, about two years now. And so what we, um, uh, you know, the, the typical uh, approach to a massive project like that is, okay, let's take it stepwise, let's first do a proof of concept, let's see how it's going to work. Of course, in the meanwhile, um, the team at NIH is building on top of even pilots um, that we produce because they, of course, want to go and market that, get their internal funding as well. So a lot of components of this project are already operational. Um, you know, for obvious reasons, we haven't yet curated 47,000 compounds. Um, so we started by first developing what we call an annotation schema to most of you here in the audience, it's a familiar concept. So in other words, you try to define every single field, every single type of information, if not the field, that you want to capture eventually for all of these compounds. So we have implemented, and that, that took us a while, it was a lot of discussions at that point with um, NIH's team and a lot of trial and error. Um, then we actually implemented our annotation schema uh, not for all components that you saw previously on that list, but for majority of them. And then we um, annotated first 100 compounds using our annotation scheme. It's very simple um, in its um, mentality, but it, it wasn't that simple to execute because really finding all those pieces of information for every compound, all of them have to be chucked. Um, it's, it's work. Um, so whatever came out of the pilot was very well received. People liked it. It really served the purpose. So we started expanding. We now uh, have close to 2,000 compounds. So how do we do this? So we obviously have to consume already available information. So starting with a simple example of molecular IDs. So we have parsed, downloaded, parsed, cleaned, arbitrated, and otherwise massaged. Um, all of these um, databases that provide appropriate IDs for our purposes, and that would, could be gene ID, compound ID, um, pathway IDs. By the way, NIH is the, probably the biggest consumer of any content anywhere in the world, so they obviously have subscriptions to pretty much any database out there. So if you downloaded your database to NIH, we'll probably are looking at it. Um, and so we are in the process arbitrating if we find conflicting um, uh, situations from different resources we have to arbitrate and in the majority of cases we're going to original literature to provide original references. 
so um, and I apologize it's a little small and faint uh, but it's it's a screenshot from the actual interface so we had to because obviously we knew that it's going to be more than one curator doing this project eventually so right from the get-go we put this um, uh, project uh, basically on the server we outfitted it with a curation interface it was a very very simple curation interface but it allows multiple people to to do their work it al also allows the uh, senior curator to either approve or kick back a record if they decide that it's not very um, um, correct let's put it this way and in the simplest format our schema actually resembles data schema resembles a triangle where we have a compound a target and an, an indication and so um or condition if you will because not all conditions are diseases and that triangle um has many to many relationship on each vertex and the reason for that is quite clear right so you your compound can treat more than one disease it can also affect more than one target a disease can be linked to more than one um, target, etc. And so um, this is the uh, uh, the main tab, uh, it, and you can see that we have all these multiple IDs which we capture as synonyms. So that's done automatically, but curators do have to, for example, copy paste the smiles back into the special program to make sure that the structure that they captured is correct. Review the stereochemistry and all these fun fun things. Um, we capture things uh, right now, for example, as originator, okay? So this is a very hard to find field, like who first made the compound, um, um, whose you know, claim, uh, claim to fame um, has to be in there. And we have a lot of uh, esoteric discussions about what constitutes the, the originator of the compound. Um, but we had this all down, so this is, um, Again, a, a little bit of our workflow schema, not very complicated, but there is certain complexity here, not to scare you with this. Um, again, we're trying to make it as simple as possible to save time on on simple stuff. Um, this is the auto population um, um, for synonyms, basically, uh, page uh, to save our curators some time searching for all this information elsewhere. Um, a little bit more of the same. Um, ah, yeah. So we're capturing um, some things that are um, not readily available in other databases as well. For example, uh, CNS activity, uh, they, they are available. I'm not saying they're not available, but they are hard to find and kind of scattered all over the place in vivo activity and in vitro activity. So uh, coming from this database, you should be able to trace um, the original experiments that, for example, uh, measured, you know, binding of your compound to a specific target, and you would at least have a good lead uh, for that. So this is a tab about conditions, what what compounds treat, and so again, um, everywhere in these in these fields, wherever possible, we leverage ontologies. So this is something that I forgot to mention. So on the back end of this application, we're running um, a SciGraph application, which allows us to enter information in already. Um, very consistent way. So there is no way that somebody can mistype or otherwise uh, mess with data. Um, and so if you're talking about asthma, everybody knows that you're talking about that asthma and nothing else, and all the IDs are captured as well. So this is the same for targets, and pretty much um, that's about it. So in this particular project, we do um, what we probably do the best here, and that is, um, you know, develop an annotation schema, capture the information, and train people so that everybody delivers quality results. Because if you want scalability and volume, that's, you know, that's challenging. Um, I do want to, um, I believe I do have time, right, Julie? Uh, so I want to really talk a little bit about a little bit more maybe interesting thing, and that's where all of this is going. So eventually the big vision again at NIH and the team we work with is that um, there will be a way of basically generate more knowledge from existing content that is just simply lying on the surface. So they are working on um, sort of like a framework that allows you to generate noble hypotheses given that you have data somewhere uh, to support your um, your hypotheses. So we have 
super excited to work with them on that. So this is sort of like the the meat, the content that will go uh, behind all of that. But on top, it, and it's not even an analytics, right? So it's more of, um, in fact, concept, or I like to call it framework, um, an ability to to extend your knowledge beyond what's like written and right in front of you. How do you make this connection? So it's not very simple. Um, and um, it kind of goes into this, into this field of artificial intelligence and how we um, actually create knowledge as human beings, how we learn things. And the interesting part is that if you think about it at the moment, the synthesis of information from all of this um, databases and publications, it really happens in individual scientists' head. And um, so obviously, uh, we are kind of limited uh, by the, first of all, our own CPU, but also, um, you know, how, may, how much time people are spending on each particular problem thinking about it, right? So it's very serious problem. And, and especially once you start thinking about what Larry just showed, right? So you get more data, data from different um, types of experiments. Your capacity to synthesize information has to increase. But from what I can tell, it doesn't. Uh, so so um, it's, it's really important to be able to do this. And so um, what we are working on is an ability to capture the information from every single publication in basically a binary format, in a, in a series of very simple um, statements that capture very simple tidbits of information. For example, compound X has ID Y, or compound X binds target Z. The next statement could be binding constant is, you know, whatever, 10 micromolar. And then, um, then you capture all of this um, massive data and then you run analytics on top of it. But essentially, you can connect these data, again, using the, the fact that you're using ontologies to capture this data, and also you build in the logic. Um, each statement potentially can have, um, well, that's what we kind of arrived at, um, a situation where it's true or false. It's very simple. It's sort of like computers think. And then um, you sort of start building this more complex um, expressions using this um, binary code, essentially. Um, but it's um, behind it, it has um, the actual data and the logic. And so we're test driving this particular approach because you really don't need anything new uh, to try it. So the technology uh, for that um, will be Neo4j in the, in the first approximation. And the content behind it can be taken from pretty much any appropriate database, including this one that I showed. And then you can start building uh, questions about, uh, uh, you know, specific scientific questions um, and try to see if your uh, logic can uh, support or, or, I don't know, approve or disprove whatever statement. So it's very interesting. And so I wanted you to be aware of this. So this particular database is coming online um, pretty much as we speak, there is a prototype available, um, but it's it, 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 at the moment it doesn't have uh, too much data, and I believe it's uh, a data that was automatically sucked in. Our pilot has to become available really, really soon, um, and I believe that they will be releasing uh, the data incrementally as it becomes available. Um, but behind it, there is also this big effort by NIH to do this kind of knowledge engineering that I tried to describe. And it's, um, to me, it's super exciting because clearly if we don't do something, we will be really buried under this tons of papers and uh, uh, very limited ability to read them and process the incoming information. And, um, okay, so just would like to thank really um, the NIH specifically NCATS team that uh, we are a part of and uh, my own team that works on that, um, the people that you've heard about before, um, and of course, we have uh, <laughs> our international curation team. I was going to put the thousand curators, but now it's not really. Um, and with this, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, guys. So, what kind of relationships you are describing? Uh, uh, try to 
Einstein the Neo for Lay database. So what kind of uh, relations is between uh, biological entities? So pretty much the ones that I tried to describe. So for example, we have logic um, to describe a compound as an entity, and it takes a few nodes to do that. And then um, a simple expression like my compound binds target gene that takes another few nodes. So the edges um, in our database are essentially the publications. And we're still figuring out how to capture the strengths of the relationship because there are so many different ways you can do that. But, um, you know, and the simplest one is that the one we always done, which is the number of publications, right? So that support your positive finding. But then the question becomes, do you really want to process all the, all the papers? Or you may, maybe want to stop at certain limit. It's, it's complicated. So this, this database has to be able to capture uh, qualitative as well as quantitative uh, aspects of the data. So, yeah. So th that's why you reduce them to very simple things first. C context is hard indeed. And then um, you, so you capture all the statements and sort of like a positive um, aff affirmation, but you provide the, um, the switch. So basically your relationship can be on or off. And so for example, you can say compound X binds target Y. And then you have 10 papers that are sitting there with the on uh, relationship, right? So that's basically saying it's true. And then you have another, I don't know, five papers that disprove that. So they are supporting your off situation. Um, so what, what needs to happen is once you, so you capture all of that and then you want to say, okay, so what happens if my, if my target is expressed in certain tissue? So the user has to have an ability to flip certain switches on, okay, to test your hypothesis, what's going to happen. You also have to keep some logic in, right? So if this is on, this has to be off, this has to be also on, etc. It's complicated. We want to see if it can be done on a small scale first. Um, and I, again, the, the only reason why I like it is because you have the content now. You can get Metabase or you can get IPA and download tons of information in that binary format, establish your sort of um, template, your uh, whatever you want to populate, populate test hypothesis. If it comes out to be too complex, we're not capable of doing this, let's move on to next technology. I'm listening to ideas. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yes. That's why I was so um, keen on attending the workshop. So yes, that's certainly one is.